Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Among the schools of philosophy that Epictetus discusses, besides that of his own Stoic school, is that of the cynics. And as opposed to the Epicureans or the academic skeptics where we see Epictetus adopting a very critical attitude towards them and, and levying some very specific uh, criticisms, areas in which he thinks they've gotten things wrong, <coughs> Epictetus doesn't say that sort of thing about the cynics. If anything, he seems to be saying they've got things not only basically right, but so right that it's, it's going to be difficult for more than a few people to live out that kind of lifestyle. Now, who were the cynics, first of all? I have to assume an audience that isn't quite you know, fully aware of post-Socratic philosophy and all the schools. They're often called a minor school of philosophy, and they get started with this guy, Antisthenes, who was a student of Socrates. And Socrates ended up inspiring a number of different people who started philosophical schools, which were um, quite often at great variance from each other. So Plato was not his only student. Antisthenes was a very important student as well. And Antisthenes took from Socrates the emphasis on virtue and the, you know, the idea that what's most important in life is to understand and to cultivate moral virtue in oneself Possessions don't really matter. Um, family relations, not particularly important, particularly if they get in the way. Um, raising children, that's not really a central concern. Instead, it's, it's, it's you know, working out for oneself what the good is and, and living that. Trying to live a life in accordance with nature, trying to live a life of freedom, a life of simplicity. That's what he took from Socrates. The other thing that the cynics really did take from Socrates as well is the notion that the philosopher plays a vital social role. So Socrates talked about himself as being the gadfly stinging the, the giant, you know, rather sluggish horse that was the city of Athens, which gets himself, you know, killed in the process. And the cynics also performed uh, a similar role, going around and pestering people and saying, your, your life is screwed up. You're not paying attention to the right things. Your priorities are all wrong. Hey, get with it, guy. Um, so the cynic school ends up playing a role in the development of Stoicism. These two schools are not only similar in many of the, the teachings that they have, uh, but they're also connected by way of origins. So, Zeno, the guy who starts the Stoic school, he studies under a Cynic philosopher, Crates. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, there's going to be a very strong influence of cynicism, a, you might say, transplantation of some of the key themes, uh, then reworked, rethought through by Zeno in ways that, to him, made more sense than what, what the Cynic school themselves were doing. But there is this, you know, very strong stress on virtue as the main or even sole good in life for human beings. Uh, living a simple life. The cynics were all about, you know, reducing things to the bare minimum. Freedom. Uh, you know, figuring out, first of all, what is freedom? Is it having a big bank account? Or is it being able to do and say what you would like to do, what you think is, you know, the best at, at that time? And social criticism. The, the cynics went around and, like I just said a minute ago, they would harangue people. Uh, you know, they'd see people dressed up going out to a banquet and they'd say, wow, how much did that stuff cost? You know, that money could have been used for something quite valuable, but you spent it on threats uh, that you're going to throw away tomorrow. Um, you know, 
all sorts of things along those lines. They, they were trying to use frankness of speech to jar people out of a sense of complacency. So what does Epictetus think about this? Well, the key question to ask, and this is the question that he actually asks the young man who comes to him and says, I think I'm going to become a cynic. Sort of like, you know, somebody today might come to their parents and say, you know, I think I'm going to go join the army. Or I think I'm going to join this group over here that has these particular beliefs. Or I'm just going to take a gap year and go travel around, you know, backpacking or something like that, right? Um, somebody comes to him and says, I want to become a cynic. And Epictetus says, okay, well, that's a, a major investment. Are you up to it? Not everybody can live this kind of lifestyle. And here's why. And then he goes on and explains to the guy uh, a number of different reasons why one needs to, you know, think this decision through. So one of these, is, and this is something that the, the cynics have in common with the Stoics, is an exclusive focus on the ruling faculty, the faculty of choice or, or moral purpose, as, you know, pro racist is, is translated. Um, they think that the good lies within us. It's not a matter of our, our body primarily, although the cynics uh, do, in fact, try to toughen their body as much as possible. Um, it's not a matter of our clothes. It's not a matter of our social position or rank. It's not a matter of the networks of friends that we have. All those sorts of things are extrinsic to us and unreliable, and they're not really part of our moral purpose. What we do have control over is the kind of person that we make ourselves into by the choices and the refusals that we engage in and how we restructure our thinking and our desiring and our feeling and all those sorts of things. So that's something that they do have in common with the Stoics. And to be a Stoic is already a rather tough proposition, according to Epictetus. He says not too many people who claim to be Stoics are in actuality living out the Stoic life because it's a, it's a difficult life uh, while you're in training. The cynics, you might say, and this is a little bit anachronistic, but you could say they doubled down on it. Um, now, I say it's anachronistic because the cynics precede the Stoics, right? But the cynics, by the time that, that they're coming on the scene as a school, they have developed a kind of way of life. And the way of life that they have chosen is a life of, of deliberate poverty. They don't have fixed dwellings. So they don't have a house. Um, Diogenes actually, who was one of, the, one of the, the cynics, he lived in a barrel in Athens. <laughs> you know, there's all sorts of interesting stories about uh, what he did. You can read all about that in Diogenes Laertes' uh, Lives of the Philosophers. Um, but they focused on a life of poverty. Why? Because if you were going to try to do this, you probably were better off not having too many encumbrances, right? They would have one cloak, and it usually was pretty rough. They would have a staff. They would have what's often translated as a wallet. We might call it a satchel or a knapsack uh, that they carried things around in. And they would, they would beg for, for food or for other things. If somebody invited them to dinner, they would often go. Um, they wouldn't promise to be a nice guest in the sense of not, you know, saying things to people because they had, you know, this, this particular role of social criticism. Uh, a simple life is possible. The idea was that that would free a person for the, the better things. And physical endurance. Diogenes, again, a uh, model cynic, would hug statues in the middle of winter to try to, you know, toughen himself up. Uh, and then he would, you know, stay out in, in the, the sun in summertime. Um, the cynics were, were pretty legendary for what they would put up with. And it wasn't just, you know, physical hardships like that. It was also enduring the sorts of abuse that they might get from their fellow citizens uh, who don't like cynics or people like them being around. The cynics also were, I should put it here as well, they also had a pretty good sense of humor. As a matter of fact, some of the comic um, uh, genres that we, we have are originally developed by, by the cynic school. Um, but that, that's a story for another day. So um, why is this going to be particularly difficult? It's already hard to work on your ruling faculty. Add to it this life of poverty, of having to beg, 
of you know putting up with with um, people thinking badly of you, uh, of simplicity, and the fact that you're cutting yourself off from external resources. And this is not something that many people are going to be able to do. It's very, very much sink or swim. Either as a, a cynic, you are going to be able to divest yourself of these things, or you're going to be one of the most envious people around, and uh, you're not going to be a very good cynic in, in that case. The other thing that Epictetus points out is cynics have this social role, and there's two sides to it. One is that they are, in effect, a messenger from God. And so they're there to <clears throat> tell human beings about what they, they need to know and generally don't want to hear. They're there to um, criticize people about the things that they take seriously and remind them about the things that they don't take seriously. They're there to show that social conventions are not really um, the, the indices of value that we take them to be. Um, they do so with humor, they do so with scorn, they do so with, with you know, shouting at people, they do so sometimes even by the, the soft approach, right? But they're, they're going to be saying things with a, a parousia or, or frankness or freedom of speech that is very characteristic of them. So they're out there in the world, you know, taking a stand for virtue against all these other things in a very public way. Um, they're also a scout for human beings in that they are themselves experientially uh, finding out whether this way of life really does make sense or whether it's a bunch of nonsense. And um, this raises some problems. As Epictetus points out, a cynic had really better have his or her act together. There were female cynics, by the way. There was even a husband-wife team uh, at one point. Um, they really better have their act together because if there's anything that's not morally pure about them, if there's anything that involves some hypocrisy, it is going to show up because they're constantly in the public sphere. Uh, and they're in the public sphere without the protection of uh, influential friends or money or being able to retreat into their house or anything like that. So Epictetus says, you got to really think this through. You know, there's, the cynic way is a wonderful way. It's the sort of thing that Hercules, you know, uh, could be identified with doing. Um, Diogenes, you know, compared himself to the great king, that is the king of Persia, and thought that he came out better in, in the comparison. But not all of us are Diogenes, and actually most of us are not. So he gives some, some caution uh, at many points in, in this chapter. He says, um, here we go. Do you see the spirit in which you're intending to set your hand to so great an enterprise? Take a mirror. Look at your shoulders. Find out what kind of loins and thighs you have. It's an Olympic contest in which you are intending to enter your name. Not some cheap and miserable contest or, or another. In the Olympic Games, it's not possible for you merely to be beaten and then leave. But, in the first place, you have to disgrace yourself in the sight of the whole civilized world, not merely before the men of Athens, or Sparta, or Nicopolis. And in the second place, the man who carelessly gets up and leaves must needs be flogged. And before he's flogged, he has to suffer thirst and scorching heat and swallow quantities of wrestler's sand. So he's saying, you know, it's like entering the Olympic Games. If you actually want to be a cynic, expect that people are going to take that very seriously, and they're going to be watching you. So, you know, what is his general evaluation of this? Great way of life. The cynics are fundamentally right about certain things, but it may not be a practical uh, way of, of improving our lives for many people. 